why no mention of capitalism and why like where where are we headed with the the, the, sure. the critique that you're talking about yeah i mean ca capitalism is is the the uh the elephant in the room right cap a capitalism system is one where the market decides on how to allocate resources and the resources are owned by cap capitalists right by individuals and so what we've done is we've built an economic system that forsakes all other values and other choices and just fits them into the mold of economic choice and market choice and market fundamentalism. Um, all of the kind of adjustments through the years of economics that have tried to bring economics back into balance with other values of society. I mean, Keynes did this in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and he called it wisely managed capitalism, right, where you really have government institutions <laughs> that supersede the capitalism framework, right? Um, the environmental movement was all about kind of reining in the, all of these feedback systems in the capitalistic model where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, where capital is, has all of these costs that aren't accounted for. So uh, whether it's, you wanna call it democratic socialism or wisely managed capitalism, or a new system of governance that is more bottom up than top down. This ultimately comes back to your original point of, is about taking power back, right? It's about who manages the economy and for what purpose, who does the economy benefit and for how long? So what is the, uh, the, the goal? Is this a, is this a, uh, is this ultimately a degrowth argument or is this a reorient, um, the way, I mean, frankly, in a more efficient way, our our resources. I mean, we we produce as a as a as a world, you know, something like twenty five percent more food than we need. It just doesn't go to the right places, and a lot of it's wasted. We have, um, we have the we we like you say, we're the wealthiest nation on earth in the history of Earth. Uh, yet we have uh, all sorts of extreme poverty. We have homelessness. We have things that don't exist in countries that are ostensibly less wealthy than us. Right. And that is really ultimately a function of, of redistribution, isn't it? It is, but it's also pre-distribution, right? It's how do we design the system uh, to begin with? And, and that's what this is about. Um, the current economic system and the current economics that we teach was built for a different time and for a different purpose, right? It was, it was built in that kind of early stage capitalism where growth was the mandate, right? I mean, all of the kind of macroeconomics that we teach was born out of the necessity of the Great Depression to get people back to work. And it was quantity, quantity, quantity. And, and don't worry about anything else until we, until we grow the economy. Um, 21st century is different. There's way more people, right? There's much of a bigger, bigger environmental problem. There's the climate crisis, crisis. There's biodiversity loss. There's growing inequality, right? We have to step back and say, this economics that we teach, we call it neoclassical economics that was crafted in the late 1800s. Is it fit for mission, right? Is it the kind of economics that fits the kinds of problems that we have today? Mm -hmm. So this is a real re, about the book is about a reprioritization of our goals of the economy. But, First and but, foremost, it's oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I thought I did not mean to cut you off. Yeah, go do ahead. one, two, three real quick. First, yeah. first is, is we should be teaching our economics that ask the question, how big should the economy be? Right. So this is your point, Sam, about uh, degrowth. Right. If we've grown an economy that's especially in Western countries that are creating more costs and benefits, what are we doing? <laughs> right. So the scale of the economy is an important question for the 21st century that was ignored in the 1800s. Once we sort of figure out what the right size of the economy should be, we've built an economic system that fails unless it's growing. So we therefore have to really rethink that as well. Who gets the benefits and who gets the costs of a right sized economy? Then we can come back to the economist's specialty of efficiency, right? That we want to create a system that is efficient and well run and well tuned. Economists are well equipped to be folks that were trained like me, to be the janitors of the market, to be the plumbers of the market, to be the mechanics of the market. But we weren't trained to be the sort of social planners of everything, to be the lords of society. And I'm afraid that's that's where we've positioned ourselves.
But I, I guess where I get confused is when you talk about like the scale of the economy or you talk yeah. about growth or not growth, these are fictionalized concepts anyways, right? I mean, like we have decided, you know, like if, if I want to measure, have I grown Is my son, my, has my son who's, who's 10, has he grown right. in the, uh, in the past three years, the, the measure I can choose uh, to measure whether he's grown is I can take a, a ruler and I can see how tall he is. Yep. The other yep. way I could do that is just by mass or I could do it by, you know, how thick he is, or I could just look at his hair and decide that's how I'm going to decide his growth. Right. Or I can say like, is he more mature? Uh, how, how sophisticated is his language become? There's, we, we have a situation. It seems to me that the, that you're, you're laying out that we've chosen one measure of, of assessing growth that uh, ostensibly is considered beneficial. And perhaps at one time it was, but it is no longer beneficial to society to measure growth in that manner. And so is the question really that whether we're looking for growth or not growth, or rather, are we looking for um, the idea of like, a, a, a just simply a different measurement, which will then implicate the values that we have chosen to assess there. So like, you know, if I decide that I want, I'm going to measure growth by height because yep. Yep. we live in a society where everything is at a, a certain shelf level. And you know, that's the most important thing. Uh, then that's the way I'll do it. But if it really is more about, you know, how much hair you have or whatever it is, then, then we do it another way. Like, I, like I get confused between the, the, the concept that we, have chosen a measure of growth that is really only that is a sort of a fraudulent sales pitch for benefits for a specific set of people in the, in, in, in our society yeah. versus the idea of like growth is bad. Well, look, so, so back to, we don't ask the question when we do our books as a nation, we don't ask the question growth for who growth for what purpose and growth for how long so take your son right <laughs> is he going to grow forever right is 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 does he get all the growth and none of your other kids can grow right like growth is a physical concept and to imagine that we can infinitely grow a person a house a nation a globe infinitely in a finite planet is fairy tale thinking why do we continue to sort of teach that fairy tale because we only count the benefits and ignore the costs. Because we only care about who the benefits go to in terms of the, the folks who own the capital and get to make the decisions over the system, right? And we ignore the the democracy that's behind the scenes that's been deprioritized. But, Growth is a physical concept. It has trade-offs. We don't teach that in economics. <laughs> we don't teach that a global national economy has trade-offs in the social costs of growth and the ecological costs of growth. Emma, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm energized by the discussion because I, I, I felt like, you know, earlier we did establish how so much of growth, though, is kind of bullshit, for, for lack of a better word. It's based on financialization. For who and for what purpose? That's the question. Right? right. But but then that's not physical in any real way, right? That's just wealth hoarding. And so then I think it comes back to a question of wealth re redistribution, the, the leftist and socialist concern about degrowth is that we uh, when we don't come at it from a ca uh, anti-capitalist perspective, the, mm -hmm. the brunt of degrowth is going to be felt by people at the bottom. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I th that's, I guess, kind of what I, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on. Right. No, if you don't if you don't take on who, who owns capital and, and, and how if you don't take on more cooperative arrangements or building a care economy or recognizing all of the other work that happens to build a well-being in society. And if you just take take the current system and degrow, then the most vulnerable inside you're going to get hurt. So the, the question is around transition. How do we orchestrate a just transition to a right-sized economy? How do we create a more nimble, smaller economy that doesn't fundamentally depend on growth? Because folks like me who are doing the math on the ecological side of things around climate change and soil loss and water pollution and, and the very air that we breathe are sort of recognizing that the system is going to be downsized either by disaster 
or by design. So the kind of economics that we would like to build in this century is an economics that downsizes and right sizes the economic system by design that does it that that centers justice that centers equity that asks the kinds of questions you're asking around financialization because mm. yeah financialization makes all this kind of money for money and money from nothing but all that money all that spending power has an ecological expression right it results in airplanes and flights and spending and and then you, you measure that the spending that we do as a society against well-being metrics against surveys like the Gallup poll or surveys on life satisfaction or surveys on well-being. And we recognize that we're growing like crazy and well-being has been flat or in decline. Right. Or that we're growing. The United States is growing in a certain style that's very privatized and very lopsided. And our metrics on poverty and on mental health and on obesity don't measure up to other kinds of of models uh, across the ocean. I feel like uh, we're, we may need another uh, another hour to get to this, but but I guess like you, the thing that I'm getting hooked, uh, you know, uh, caught up on is is yeah. the, sort of the same sort of a point I think that Emma is making is that if growth is just a concept, like I mean, it, it, like for instance, okay, you mentioned airplanes, right? We're flying all over the place. Well, what if we decided as a society in or in this country? That um, we're going to uh, um, heavily regulate airplanes. Uh, there's only going to be uh, flights. You, there are no more hour-long flights in this country. Uh, they're only going to be, let's say, um, you know, three-hour flights. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is we're going to build high-speed rail. And we're going to build, um, you know, more uh, uh, more public transportation. And we're going to go back to really the sort of like the the, the railway system we had 150 years ago or 100 years ago in this country. Um, and we're going to uh, develop technologies. Um, I, you know, I, I'm just throwing it out there. But uh, let's say, you know, uh, nuclear power that is going to provide electricity for these things. Um, I have some issues with, with nuclear power, but I'm just using this as, as an example. Um, and as a society, we're going to essentially, you know, flatten things. Uh -huh. Airlines, only very limited use, more public transportation. That's going to theoretically grow the economy, right? I mean, we're going to see like this, this huge industry uh, and we're going to employ a lot more people uh, on these railway lines. And we're going to have a lot more uh, activity because people are going to be able to travel more. Uh, and it's going to be uh, the, the travel is going to be open to a, a broader swath of people. What 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 is that what you're talking about or is that problematic in, no, in the perspective? You're giving examples of, of striking a new kind of balance. You're giving examples of growing certain activities and degrowing other activities. Right. You're giving an example of, of providing people with more choice, for example, with transportation, not less. You're giving an example. I mean, if we're imagining a society that's fit for purpose and a society that's fit with what the planet can support, we're probably looking at a decentralization of, of power and production, right? We're looking at a relocalization of economic, of, of, of economic systems. We're looking at systems that are still interconnected through trade, right? But not trade for for plastic choice from toys from China trade for things that actually improve people's lives. Um, we're looking at a kind of creating a well-being economy, right? A well-being economy that prioritizes sufficiency, that prioritizes, you know, take the sustainable development goals, you know, that nearly all the world's countries have agreed upon, right? That prioritizes a good life that is fits within the means of the planet, right? This is the question to ask in 2023, not in 1823. The question to ask is, how do we create a good life within our means? Um, and that's the kind of economics that we're trying to create and, and, uh, and build. Um, an, an economics that's based in biophysical reality, an economics that um, centers social equity and justice. An economics that just doesn't just like a, a roll of the dice and, you know, hey, whoever whoever wins with the most stuff 
dies the happiness, the happiest, which just ain't true, right? You look at all the social ecological research, right? Um, the bloated economies like the United States aren't taking care of, of our own people, of our own citizens, yet we're still on this kind of treadmill and we're all stuck in these rat races and we're, we're sort of running around and around and around the hamster wheel saying, growth will solve the problems that growth creates. What happens now? What do we do next? Don't worry, growth will solve the problems that growth creates, right? Instead of asking the questions around redistribution, instead of asking the questions about ownership, instead of asking the questions about public finance versus private financialization, right? All of these questions are the context of a new economics and a new economy. John Sorry, D. Erickson. You got, up, you got me up on my uh, soapbox here. No, well, that's, that's what we brought you here for. John D. Erickson, professor of sustainability, science and policy at the University of Vermont, author of The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Awesome. Thank you.